This magnificent new Cadillac presents truly thrilling beauty in every detail and from every angle. Inside, you see luxury and graciousness. With the 1957 DeSoto, barely four feet seven inches from road to glamorous roof. Here in DeSoto is the exciting new shape of motion. Flight sweep styling, tail fins for highway stability. This is the breathtaking beauty of Flight Sweep 57. Boldly individual, unmistakably Cadillac, El Dorado, the world's finest personal car. In the automotive realm, there are few things that ever remain the same. The life cycles of new products from Detroit are in a constant state of updating, upgrading, refinement, and redefinition. The constantly changing tides of consumer demand are reshaping the thought curves of automotive designers and engineers on a perpetual, untiring basis. Almost like an automobile itself, this need for innovation is most evident while it is in motion. Perhaps no car ever conceived in America has better adapted to this insatiable desire for personal transportation that reflects the tastes of an ever-shifting style market than the Ford Thunderbird. While avoiding stale repetitiveness and tedious predictability, it has maintained an image of youthful energy. Over four million Thunderbirds have rolled from Ford's assembly lines in a lifespan that stretches back to the mid-1950s. It became a far different automobile in only its fourth year when compared to what it was in its first and has altered its flight path throughout four decades of critical acclaim and tumultuous criticism. An unqualified success to some, a marketing chameleon to others, and a source of nostalgic satisfaction to many more. The Thunderbird is as familiar a name as has ever been hatched in Motown. But much of how it was born and how it has avoided permanent extinction may be less well known. How was it first proposed and what were the dynamics in post-World War II America that led to the creation of Ford's first production two-seater? What were the market forces that necessitated an endless string of design and marketing changes, sometimes in opposition to what other nameplates were offering? And despite its forward progress, sometimes interrupted by its occasional marketing missteps, how has it maintained its unique speciality? In the next hour, we'll try to bring the answers to those questions into focus as we embark on Changing Flight Paths, the Thunderbird's story of style. World War II will always be remembered as an epic conflict that deflected history's course of events forever. Much of its impact, however, was to be felt after its conclusion, especially in the United States as social, cultural, and economical priorities suddenly reverted back to peacetime parameters. While serving in Europe, American GIs became steadily familiar with the various makes of small-bore sports cars being produced overseas. For instance, in England, MGs, Triumphs, and Austin Healys were encountered on a daily basis and were unlike anything that the GIs had ever seen at home. Americans had always been drawn to the bigger is better ideology of how cars should be built. That belief had actually taken root during the late 1920s and 1930s, when domestic automobile producers such as Cadillac, Packard, and Pierce Arrow flaunted their massive size and extreme bulk as equivalents for unmatched quality. In the 1940s, despite a wartime economy, the average American equated personal success and social status with the ownership of big, roomy, powerful sedans and convertibles. And with new car production put on hold until war's end, Detroit was making full preparations to outsize the competition once the assembly lines were set back into motion. Little did Detroit know that the thousands of returning servicemen coming home in the mid-1940s would steer the course of the country's automotive future into an entirely new direction. What you really have to do is go back 
the Second World War, when it first ended, you've got to realize that the European countries were decimated. They're, they had some sports cars over there. We had all our soldiers over there. Our soldiers did see the sports cars, which was something in this, this country never had. Uh, when the GIs started returning home, let's face it, there was money available. Cars weren't. People liked the idea of having sporty type cars. Well, of course, the Europeans needed money. So one, well, how do you earn money? I mean, the Marshall Plan was helping them somewhat, but they still had to earn money on their own. So consequently, they started exporting large ticket items such as automobiles. The type of automobile they exported over here, sports cars. Well, the MG was possibly one of the first cars that they brought into this country, and the, the people loved them. Well, that didn't take long for like Jaguar, your Triumphs, your Austins, to do the same thing. Before I know it, why the, the boom was on. The 1950s in America was a supremely ideal period to introduce cars that reflected a positive, upbeat mindset that was sweeping the country. America was coming out of almost three decades of war, economic turmoil, and post-depression shockwaves by the time this new decade was getting into high gear. The corporate decision makers at Ford had already informally discussed the creation of a sports-influenced entry as early as 1952. With Chevrolet's announcement in summer of 1953 that a two-seat roadster called the Corvette was about to hit their showrooms in the spring of the following year, Ford pressed their design and engineering teams to answer the bell. Frank Hershey was basically your, your director at the time. When he found out that we needed a sports car, and he had been working on one with Bill Boyer uh, for about two years, uh, basically on their own, they were just more or less puddling with little 3 8 models, things of that sort. When he found out that we were going to get the go-ahead because, uh, well, George Walker, uh, evidently was in Europe at the time with uh, a fellow by the name of Caruso who was the, he was in charge of Ford Division. And uh, Bob Caruso says to Walker, well, how come we don't have a car like that? And Walker says, well, we, well, we do. Well, it's sort of, <laughs> if we do and we don't. But anyway, uh, he made some hurry up phone calls back home here. And uh, sure enough, by the time they came home, there was a sports car to be seen, even if it was a small model. Ford executives had already seen the Corvette make its debut at the 1953 GM Autorama in New York on July 14th. There was no time to lose in finalizing the new Ford Roadster, scheduled to make its debut at the 1954 Detroit Auto Show in February of that year. If Ford was to steal any of the thunder already claimed by the competition, this was one deadline that couldn't be missed. With the 1954 Detroit Auto Show fast approaching, the new Ford Roadster began taking shape in the Ford design studios. But this could not be a carte blanche, fill out a blank check type of project. The configuration of this new car would have to address certain styling and economic realities if it were to pass corporate muster. The T-Bird wasn't designed in a, in a vacuum solely by itself. The T-Bird really came somewhat as a, as a stepchild to the full-size Ford. Uh, which was being developed in parallel. Uh, the gestation period for a car from the, time it, from the time conceptual design begins until the point where it's released for production is around two and a half or three years. At least that's what it was back around that time. That period is shortened up considerably with the advent of computer-aided design, that type of thing. But uh, a lot of the lines and a lot of the components of the T-Bird uh, were by mandate derived from the full-size Ford in order to utilize uh, a lot of the same parts in order to keep the cost of the car down. About, uh, oh, it had to be around 1952 or so, uh, we had been toying with uh, different designs for sports cars because of the fact, like I said before, the, uh, they were getting very popular in this country. So. We had already developed the 
55 Fords, all right? And the idea was to really give you a scaled down version of a 55 Ford. So they could use things like headlight bezels, things of that nature on the little bird and component parts. So really what it amounted to is uh, they, they, took a, they took a 55 Ford and dehydrated it. Hershey was really influenced by uh, jet aircraft. He was influenced by uh, cars like the Ferrari of the period. When you look at the egg crate grill, for instance, on a 55 through 57, you see a lot of Ferrari influence and in how it had an oval shape to it, how it had a grid uh, for a mesh. When you look at the rear of the car, you see hints of uh, exhaust tubes from jet fighters. The semi-aircraft, semi-dehydrated design met with almost unanimous approval with Ford's upper management. Once unveiled at the Detroit show, the actual production version would be first seen in October of 1954. Its name, the Ford Thunderbird. And how that title was arrived at is one of Detroit's more quirky legacies. We had a designer, his name was Alvin Guyberson, called, everybody called him Gibb. And, uh, he had uh, spent quite a bit of time in the Southwest, loved the Indian artifacts. Well, one of the gods that the Indian people revered was a thunderbird. This was the type of a god that you would only see if you were of the right type of person, or if you led a good life. Uh, on a stormy night, when it would be lightning, and if you were to look up to the heavens, and you would see them flitting by momentarily, just as the lightning would light up the sky. And then, of course, when it would black out, you wouldn't see it. And then if it would light up again, you could see the bird. So you'd only be seen flitting and only by the proper people. So consequently, the Thunderbird name stuck whenever he uh, entered it in this contest because Ford didn't know what to call the new car. And uh, they offered a $100 suit. Now, $100 doesn't sound like much today. Got to realize that's if you were earning $100 a week in, the, in that era, that was darn good money. So he won himself a $100 suit. While the Corvette had helped to provide the spontaneous combustion at Ford that spawned their new Roadster, there were few similarities shared by these two-seat rivals other than their small, racy themes. Ford's marketing campaigns hinted at the Thunderbird's high output performance, but the underlying image that Ford hoped to convey was one of luxury rather than speed and handling. T-Bird's expected competitor were cars like the Jaguar XK120 at the high end, and at the low end, it was the MG Roadsters, the period, the MG uh, Bs, the TDs, uh, those, those kinds of cars. They were, they were open cars, they were two-seaters, and as the Corvette came on strong, of course, that really became uh, pretty much the major competition for the car, but as it was originally designed, uh, Corvette didn't factor very heavily in the picture because Ford was aiming as, at, at a luxury car as opposed to a sports car. Our tact was a little different than what GM did. They built a car that was more or less more sports oriented. It was, it was fiberglass, it was hard riding, it was a six cylinder engine, it didn't have all the amenities that ours did. Uh, we, we followed a different line entirely. What we did is we basically built a scaled down convertible. And it had everything that everybody wanted. And we evidently did the right thing because in the three years that we did build a two-passenger sports car, uh, we outsold them all the way around. When the car was originally brought out, they were expecting to build 10,000 cars a year. And within the first day that the car was out, they had orders for 4,000 cars. So they had no idea how popular the car was going to be. And as far as its influence into today, no, I don't think there was a clue as to how uh, much of an icon that car would eventually become. Thunderbird's running start in the marketplace made it an instant sensation. Ford had hit the bullseye. The car boasted plenty of power with its 292 cubic inch V8 engine, and it made a strong statement of style. So much so 
that Ford did little to change the T-Bird for three consecutive years. Other than small cosmetic refinements, such as the addition of the now famous porthole rear quarter window, the 1955, 56, and 57 Thunderbirds were a cinch to spot from a mile away. I think the car was an instant success because of several reasons. Number one, uh, it was a very, uh, very unique car as far as styling was concerned. Uh, it had very clean lines as compared to a lot of the cars that were coming out of the period that were very bulbous. It was very low to the ground. It had a lot of nice features like an automatic transmission, power windows, and a decent sized engine that the Corvette didn't have. There was also a lot of interest in uh, having a car that was, that was decent on the road, not necessarily uh, a car that was really uh, meant for the racetrack, like a Corvette was really bred to be done. The Ford was guaranteed an absolute traffic showstopper. The dealers absolutely loved this car because now they had something that they could place in the showrooms that would bring people in off the street. It was a car like none other. I mean, you've got to realize that there were other sporty type cars that weren't necessarily a foreign manufacturer that were made in this country. I mean, like, uh, for example, Kaiser had their little Kaiser Darren. Of course, there was a Corvette. Uh, Nash had an imported car, the Healy, Nash Healy. But uh, there was nothing like the T-Bird. It seemed to have a certain mystique. I mean, it, there was just, it was the type of car that just, it got under your skin and you loved it the first time you saw it. You didn't have that feeling for the other cars. You really didn't. I think the reason why its styling is so unique is just because of the proportions. It was low, it was somewhat compact, and there were a lot of classic lines that that Hershey and Boyer and all the people that were involved put into the car. It was, it was very well thought out proportionally. Uh, it was the right car at the right time. You've got to realize, like in California, as an example, you had your little deuce coupes, things of that nature, and then this was just an absolute follow-through of that, of that particular type of car, and there was nobody else but Ford could do it. It was made to be uh, something to jaunt around town, and it wasn't necessarily a good car to have on long trips or to carry uh, a lot of people in. Well, as far as the type of person that would buy a car like this, you've got to realize that uh, it wouldn't be a family person unless it was a second car. So consequently, it would have to be a, a sporty type individual. It was definitely a kind of a car you would take to a country club. Ford was on a roll. Image was indeed a hot item in the high-spirited 50s and the sweet aroma of success was spilling from Dearborn, across the entire Ford product line, and the T-Bird was joining a winning team. The public really liked the way Ford was handling their styling, their engineering. They loved the new engines. We, we were in the process of bringing out the, these Y-block engines, and they were really something. We were ahead of General Motors in that respect. They were still running around the Chevrolets with their six-cylinder engines. So, we were, we were up in a, really, we were up a, ahead of them. You've got to realize that the, the Ford boys, the, the, three, the three brothers, uh, they were in their early 30s, and, and uh, young Bill Ford was really in his late 20s, so they were young, they were aggressive, they were putting the world on fire. They were, they were showing what could be done. I mean, they, they brought Ford in off their knees. I mean, we were, we were losing money uh, back in 45, I mean, by, gosh, it was, millions every week. It, if it had it kept on going, uh, there wouldn't have been any Ford Motor Company. People don't realize that Chrysler was in number two spot at one time, and Ford was number three. So uh, once we got going, we were going, and by golly, we weren't about to be stopped. In fact, despite the increased activity at Ford dealerships with a car that attracted flocks of customers, Ford was in the grip of a disturbing conundrum. T-Birds were actually losing money for the corporate giant. This, compounded by the issue of the Thunderbird's lack of space, touched off the single biggest design change that the Thunderbird would ever receive. Ford's head man at the time, Louis Crusoe, favored the small roadster T-Bird and felt it was the key to the car's appeal. But the two-seat concept was hopelessly doomed, and ironically, had been almost from the same time the original concept was taking shape. Around New Year's in 1955, the vice president of Ford Motor Company was being promoted to president and 
taking his place was one of the whiz kids that was brought on after World War II, a gentleman by the name of Robert McNamara. McNamara was very in tune with sales and profitability. And when he saw that the T-Bird wasn't really covering its weight or its cost, uh, he issued a mandate, either uh, you make this car into a four-seater so that it will sell or else I'm going to kill it. And that is one of the main reasons why the T-Bird uh, was changed from a two-seater to four-seater. And this was before the car had even been in production and in the hands of people six months even four months for that matter. McNamara was brilliant. He was a uh, he was a bean counter, though. No two ways about it. He was going to make money. It wasn't that he didn't like the car. So uh, they we were we were really big in those days as far as uh, having surveys. We were real big on surveys. The surveys we had all proved that a four place car would sell better than a two place car. And even a lot of people that the dealers heard from, they used to say, boy, I sure love to get a T-Bird, but if it only held four people, because we'd like to have two couples. So that's really what happened. In 1958, Detroit produced some of the most extravagantly excessive cars ever to roll from an assembly line. Chrome was the standard of currency that bought the attention of the American buying public. Ford's timing in bringing their four-seat Thunderbird to the marketplace could not have been timed better. Larger, heavier, and laden with bright work, only the most unmovable sports car purist refused to buy into the new direction of the T-Bird. Dubbed the Square Birds because of their distinctively squared-off roofline, they would carry the personal luxury standard for Ford through the 1960 model year. Square Birds were the second generation of the Thunderbird. And they were developed because uh, people complained that there wasn't enough room for four people. They complained there wasn't enough room for golf clubs. They complained that there wasn't enough room for luggage. And so the designer started as early as the end of 1954 to go ahead and develop a four-seat T-Bird. As time went on, uh, the designers had, had such a free hand in its design that they had virtually carte blanche as far as styling is concerned, and the engineers, for once, had to follow behind them as far as developing the internal structure, the drivetrain, and those types of things uh, to make the car work. Uh, they were low. They were really racy cars. They, uh, they, they turned the, com uh, the company around as far as uh, that type of a car was concerned. And you had cars like Tornados to follow. You had cars like uh, Riviera, Buick Rivieras. So they, uh, they meant something. They weren't just there for a niche car. They, they were a car that were important. Sales of the four-seat Thunderbird were, to put it mildly, sensational. 37,000 units were sold in 1958. Additional power upgrades and optional equipment pushed T-Bird sales to 67,000 in 1959 and 90,000 in 1960. Thunderbirds were showing up on the NASCAR circuit, and Ford seized upon their popularity to boost the interest in their other product lines. The T-Bird was a moneymaker. But the firestorm of disagreement that was kindled by the 1958 design change spelled other changes at the highest levels of the company, as George Walker, an ally of Robert McNamara, would move into the position of vice president of styling replacing disgruntled design chief Frank Hershey. Well, the way it really turned out in later years, after the two-place uh, T-Bird had uh, run its course of three years, uh, when the four-place bird came about, the square bird as we refer to it as, uh, Hershey and, Wa and Walker evidently had gotten into it uh, because there really was no definitive director in that era. So, uh, Hershey was out and Walker was in. The 1960s was a decade emerging with a greater national emphasis on science, technology, and the ever-broadening boundaries of what was lying ahead. The T-Bird was about to change again, and its shape and character would take their cues from this era of high expectations.
minus 20 seconds and counting. Guidance internal, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, engines on, 5, 4, 3, 2, launch commit, go. Americans turned their collective attention to the vast reaches of outer space as the 1960s took shape. The launching of the Echo-1 communication satellite and the anticipated creation of a national manned spaceflight program brought a tangibility to where our technological future was leading. At Ford, the 1961 model year ushered in a new shape for the Thunderbird, its third redesign in only seven years. The 1961 T-Birds, nicknamed the Bullet Birds or Rocket Birds, had sleeker front sheet metal, less body sculpturing, and many more curved lines. And the new Thunderbird was an overwhelming choice to pace the 1961 Indianapolis 500. What may not have been so popular was the sticker price. When introduced in 1955, the T-Bird retailed for about $2,600. A fully optioned 1961 bird came in at well over $4,000. With the newly introduced sports roadster, equipped with its distinctive dual headrest tonneau cover, cost over $5,000. 61 through 63 carried a lot of the same themes that the 50 through 60 had, bucket seats, center console that bisected the car. The main difference between one through three and the 58 through 60 was a more pronounced bullet style shape. Uh, the front end was described as looking like a fleet submarine and the rear end was described as having flower pot tail lights. And that again comes back to uh, the aviation images of exhaust tubes. Sales of the 1961 and 1962 T-Birds were outstanding. Over 70,000 Thunderbirds were sold to eager buyers in the 1962 model year. The Thunderbirds' combination of unique style, plush appointments, and liberal standard equipment features had pretty much given it a market all to itself. The memories of the early birds of the 1950s were but faded visions. But 1963 was a year that would take the T-Bird and its corporate step-parents by surprise and touch off yet another change in the silhouette of this resilient trendsetter. It was a time of great indecision at the Dearborn headquarters. We never really decided which way we wanted to go to the car because the competition was always so strange to us in, in that segment. Of, and we were, we were the leaders. And uh, which way do you lead? You know, when, when you're a leader, it's, it's, it's hard to determine your path. The path had suddenly become crowded. Buick had introduced its Riviera as the 1963 Thunderbird was hitting the Ford dealerships. Pontiac had brought the Grand Prix aboard in late 1962, and its 1963 version was a smash. In all, some 15,000 fewer Thunderbirds would be built in 1963. Changes for the Thunderbird were once again placed on the table for the upcoming model year. Well, 64 through 66, uh, a lot of people struggle with what the, what to call the car because the 64 through 6 was intentionally uh, designed as a synthesis of the first two generations. You see hints of the 58 through 60 in the rear as far as the way the taillights are oriented in an oblong fashion. You see hints of the 61 through 3 in the front as far as the prow of the nose is concerned. Uh, again, you still have the trademark bucket seats, the center console, the uh, subdivided rear seat which had a wraparound back uh, that was considered very novel at the time uh, and it also carried through with the, uh, the square roof line type of design that was a symbol of the T-Bird. The 1964 Thunderbird took on the assault of the competing personal luxury offerings from GM and Chrysler and soundly overcame it. The 1964 T-Bird took the general styling theme of the previous generation of cars and gave it more visual energy. It was a success with a host of industry critics and the public at large. And large it was. Now some 300 pounds heavier than the model it replaced, the T-Bird no longer clung to any pretensions of it being anything other than what it was. A two and a half ton, super luxurious, 
prestige four-seater that was stuffed with every convenience and comfort feature ever devised by Dearborn. The 1964 Thunderbird Coupes and Convertibles missed setting a new all-time sales record for the mark by only 378 cars. But the seesaw existence of the Thunderbird was about to take another dip as 1964 came to a close. Elsewhere in the industry, muscle cars were snatching the automotive spotlight away. The age of factory horsepower and lightning-fast streetcars were stealing the thunder at automobile dealerships. Ford's total performance campaign would send the Blue Oval to national and international acclaim at racetracks worldwide. But the Thunderbird would take a sales broadside from an entirely new creation that was born in the very same studios from which it had emerged a decade earlier. That creation was something called the Pony Car. In April of 1964, the Ford Mustang made its glittering debut. It was a car that ambushed every other manufacturer and gave birth to a fresh new market segment the under 25s. The pony car would become a worldwide success story, but for the Thunderbird, it was just the kind of competition it could do without. The Mustang had, had a great influence uh, on the way that sales for T-Bird dwindled along with the introduction of competing cars like the Riviera, the Eldorado, uh, Grand Prix, uh, Monte Carlo later on even. Mustang, when it was released in April of 64, had a lot of the same virtues that uh, the Little Bird had. It was small. It had a very good power to weight ratio with small block 289, and especially in its hotter forms like the 271 horse motor. The car could hold four people. You could order the thing out as spartan or as luxurious as you wanted to. I mean, there was a wide range of options that you could choose for the Mustang. And it was smaller, it was easier to drive, it was sportier, it was in general a lot more fun than uh, a car that weighed over two tons <laughs> when you roll over the scale. The 1965 Thunderbird sold a whopping 20,000 fewer units than in 1964. In 1966, T-Bird sales dropped another 10,000, despite more power from an optional 428 cubic inch engine and an infinite list of options, combined with numerous standard features, from power steering to power front disc brakes and Ford's Cruise-O-Matic automatic transmission. Even the most hardened critics grudgingly admitted that the T-Bird was one of the best luxury-based sports models in the world. But favorable reviews alone couldn't stanch the dip in Thunderbird sales figures. Even the T-Bird convertible, a car that epitomized the youthful exuberance generated by T-Bird ownership, was dropped after the 1966 model year. Another drastic change was piped aboard as the 1967 Thunderbird made its fall of 1966 appearance. From the 67 through 69 series, the car really took on a luxury emphasis. Uh, T-Bird was regarded as a cousin to the Lincoln Mark III, Mark IV. In fact, the Mark III and the Mark IV were built on the same platform as the T-Bird, utilized a lot of the same mechanical components, and were actually built on the same assembly lines in Wixom, Michigan, and in Pico Rivera, California. The fifth styling generation of the Thunderbird left T-Bird traditionalists gasping for their breath. The T-Bird was more Lincoln than any of them wanted to admit. There was no turning back now for Thunderbird. Ford had cast its lot with the full-blown luxury market. Even the Thunderbird's new for 1967 four-door model seemed to finalize its unswerving path into the realm of the Luxo barge. The 67 through, 60, through, 69, through 69 series and to a limited extent on, on through 71, uh, was gr was greatly influenced by the fact that uh, designers were no longer trying to accommodate a convertible in the in the lineup. It was mandated that after '66 there be no ragtop in the in the T-Bird line. Despite its heavy metal image and total abdication of its performance roots, the 1967 Thunderbird went on to score its fourth best sales figures in its history. 
the two-seat T-Bird loyalists had little to celebrate. Nor was the news any better for them in 1968 or 1969, as Ford stayed the course with the ultra-luxurious Thunderbirds. Sales crumbled again in 1969, falling to only 49,000 units, while Pontiac's Grand Prix was tallying over 112,000 cars sold. Charismatic Bunky Knudsen had moved into the presidency at Ford late in the fifth styling cycle of the Thunderbird. He had cut his teeth at General Motors and brought his own philosophies of what sells cars to his new position with an unchangeable attitude. Knudsen's tenure at Ford was alarmingly brief, due to a bitter dispute with Ford's headstrong patriarch, Henry Ford II. But his influence was seen in the next design interpretation of the Thunderbird in 1970. The 70 cars got big. They were generally, uh, you were generally getting into a, a small mark by that time. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we got into the Bunky Knudsen era, and one of his expressions was, when in doubt, chrome it out. And, uh, oh, did we ever. So, <laughs> they, were, they were beautiful cars, but boy, you didn't want to bump the front end. They were delicate. They were gorgeous, but they were big. 1970 sales figures were unchanged from 1969, and they took another slide in 1971. Bunky's birds, as they were called, did little to reverse the downward spiral of the T-Bird's popularity. At Ford, the T-Bird itself seemed to be at risk of extinction. People complained about the lack of luggage space. They complained about uh, lack of passenger space. And that almost, that almost killed the car. Uh, as they decided to go with the four-seater and saw the sales, sky, and saw the sales skyrocket, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people uh, bemoaned the fact that the two-seater had died, but uh, it was an economic decision that, that paid off. By 1972, the T-Bird program was desperate for a turnaround. Soon it would find its corporate benefactor and his name was Iacocca. By 1972, Lee Iacocca had become the man who called the shots at Ford. His phenomenal success as the godfather of the Mustang gave him the clout he needed to set the mission statement for revitalizing the Thunderbird. Iacocca believed that bigger was indeed better, and the 1972 through 1976 Thunderbirds reflected his size-driven policy. And Thunderbird sales figures bolstered his position. Despite gas-guzzling engines during two oil shortages and steadily climbing sticker prices, the 1972 and 73 Big Birds sold big numbers, up to 57,000 in 1972, and another 30,000 over that in 73. But 1974 and 1975 saw sales slip yet again. Maybe the Thunderbird mystique had finally lost its magic. Ford's problem was really trying to determine how to keep the spark alive in this type of a car. Uh, you're the leader, which what do you do? Uh, the government is after you on all fronts. Safety people are doing the same. Uh, we even went so far as to have four-cylinder T-Birds. We had supercharged six-cylinder T-Birds in order to try to get better gas economy. You started getting into bumpers that were made out of plastic for impact. You started getting into all kinds of safety restraints. Uh, things were tough. Things were real tough uh, designing cars in that era. Uh, you didn't have the freedom any longer. It wasn't what you wanted to do. It's what you had to do and what was required to get that particular phase done. 1977 saw still another shift in Thunderbird design, and perhaps more importantly, a change in T-Bird pricing. The newly designed cars boasted a base price that was $5,000 lower than the previous years. The response was stunning. A total of over 318,000 cars were sold. Ford came to the table with yet another T-Bird design in 1980 that carried over to the 1982 model year, and to many, the least desirable series of Thunderbirds, as they had now become smaller, lighter, and most notably, mated to the same platforms as other less prestigious Ford products. 
lowest point for the T-Bird was a period right after probably one of its biggest highs during the early 80s. Uh, the demands of corporate average fuel economy standards, pollution uh, controls are being mandated by the EPA, really played a hand in turning the car into nothing more than a rolling econobox. Uh, the platform of the T-Bird from 80 through 82 is based on the same platform that the, fair, that the Fairmont and the Futura were on. And so uh, it was not necessarily inspired styling. It was better than some of the stuff that was out there, but it just was not the, uh, the sales generator that the previous generation had been. I'd say the 8382s was, was the lowest point in the, in the Bird's existence. Then, in 1983, Ford moved the Thunderbird into its newest dimension of form and function with what were called the Aero Birds. New sleeker sheet metal, new powertrains, and a string of successes on the Winston Cup circuit gave this generation of T-Bird high praise from a responsive public. Production remained solidly staked in the six-figure bracket, and the T-Bird began to shake its image of luxury at the expense of performance. Another design revision in 1989, and a continued emphasis on performance backed by a supercharged V6-powered bird wearing the Super Coupe name, helped to punch up the Thunderbird's muscle-bound pretensions. But to many, the Thunderbird's most glorious years were well behind it. Well, the fact that the last generation Thunderbird did have independent rear suspension, it had uh, a V8 optional, it had four-wheel disc brakes, it was on paper a great car. And I think Ford was trying to recapture uh, a lot of the, you know, the performance and the excitement of the car past they had. They had the Super Coupe version, which never sold well. It was pretty expensive, a supercharged six. I think the T-Bird's mission in the 90s uh, was somewhat the same as when it originally came out back in the mid-50s. It was an image builder for the company. Uh, Ford used the T-Bird platform and the Cougar platform uh, to a lesser extent uh, as a way to promote uh, performance, obviously its use as uh, a stock car, a NASCAR, uh, in those types of circles uh, helped to bolster uh, the T-Bird's image as uh, a car that you could uh, want to drive around, say Darlington, uh, on one weekend and uh, be able to jump into something that looked like it as you left, as you left the track and hang your uh, hang your favorite emblem on for uh, Bill Elliott or uh, Rusty Wallace or who or who have you. I think a lot. I think a lot of that that linkage between uh, stock car racing and fan support is what kept the Tiber afloat uh, during the during the late 80s and the 90s. And as the 90s decade draws to a close, the Thunderbird itself has gone into temporary retirement with a new T-Bird rumored to be on its way as the new millennium opens. It is simply more Thunderbird than ever. There's a new Thunderbird convertible, too, with four-passenger luxury for all the world to see. The Thunderbird touch is everywhere. In no other American car will you find this, an optional swing-away steering wheel that moves over to welcome you in, then pivots smoothly back to the normal driving position. Or this, a rear view mirror permanently bonded to the windshield to give you a better view of the cars you leave behind. There's a new Thunderbird motion too. You can feel the eager might of the new Thunderbird 390 Special V8 engine that wings you swiftly, silently, up to highway speed. You bridle it through turns with a touch. It happens this way only in a Thunderbird. Perhaps more than any car ever produced, the Thunderbird is a survivor. In the beginning, it was a car that captured the playful, fun-loving spirit in all of us. And as time went on, it was asked to fulfill much grander visions of wealth and status. Its lifespan, not unlike our own, 
has experienced its share of triumphs and stumbles. Well, the Thunderbird, I think, had great image. The 55 through the 57 were the two-seat cars. The first four-seat was 58. That went through 60 in that iteration. Then up through 63 was the next, and then 64 through 66. But in 67's where it all changed. You could get a four-door. You could get a Landau roof. You could get, you know, the velour upholstery and the ankle-deep carpet. It kind of went downhill. But the ironic thing, each time they made the Thunderbird bigger and more luxurious, they sold more. So go figure. I think of what it tells you is that Americans at that point wanted a car that sounded sporty, but really was more of a, of a luxury car. So if you take it up into the 70s, the car just was basically a nameplate only on a, something that could have just as well have been an LTD. In 83, they came back out with the turbo coupe and the brand new aerodynamic looking car. Really was a very nice step forward and a, and a bold move on Ford's part. Uh, but again, that car kind of languished through the years and uh, when they finally canceled it last year, it was about down to, to, to rent a car status, unfortunately. And yet, despite its fascinating past, riddled with an endless kaleidoscope of changing flight paths, we continue to ask, what makes this durable icon so special? Probably the people themselves when you get right down to it. Because let's face it, a company can only make a car, just a piece of iron, but it takes the people to give it life. I mean, we, we can give it, we can give it the, the shape and, the, and we can give it the breath, but people really got to give it life. It's what they do with the car. It was a good time car. It was a happy car. It was a fun car. It was meant to be that way and it turned out to be that way.